my name is Cindy Larive. Um, I have the great pleasure to be the interim provost and executive vice chancellor here at UCR. I'm also a professor of chemistry. And I'm wel here to welcome you tonight to uh, this session, which is fifth in our s series of six symposia, uh, entitled Living the Promise, as a way of highlighting some of the most exciting research that's happening at UC Riverside. The themes for the symposia were developed around our campus strategic plan. And the, the symposium that we're having this evening is about renewable nature. And this is such an amazing setting to have that discussion. I just wanted to mention a little bit about our Living the Promise campaign, which is uh, the first ca uh, campaign uh, that the university has undertaken. Our goal is to raise $300 million by 2020 to support uh, student success uh, through scholarships and other kinds of, of activities, faculty and research support, and to expand the facilities and infrastructure that's, that the university depends upon. Uh, we are living the promise to be able to um, reflect our impact on a changing society uh, by driving science, uh, humanities, social science, engineering, and other important technological areas, as well as focusing on diversity, inclusion, and community. Uh, as a public land grant research university, this is an integral part of our mission. And UCR uh, is proud to engage with our community, both in the inland region of California and around the globe. Uh, I'm also happy to tell you that as of February 6th of this year, we've already raised 56% of our $300 million goal. So we're well on our way, and I expect that we'll surpass, surpass that goal in due time. So uh, we've had six uh, symposia that are planned for this year. Uh, the next one, which will be called New Voices and Visions, will uh, will be held in May, and I hope that you will be able to join us for that as well. So with that, I'd like to introduce and welcome uh, Susan Strait, who is a distinguished professor of creative writing. You've probably heard about many of her books. She's our hometown hero. And uh, today she's going to perform for us a live reading from her essay entitled, The River in Me. Susan. Thank you. Um, actually, being here at the Botanic Gardens is really nice for me because I am probably, I think I'm the only professor on campus who's a native of Riverside. I grew up across the street, and I taught my niece and all my daughters to walk just up that hill because the Botanic Gardens was not only beautiful but safe. Um, they knew nobody could bother them here. And uh, I was here last week walking with my friends who told lots of stories about hanging out in the gardens. Uh, that's another story. <laughs> I'm going to read you a little bit of an essay that was published in Orion, and it's about the Santa Ana River. And the, the purpose, to me, is to talk about why a place should remain wild. Because I love the Botanic Gardens, but my, my daughters also learn something about the wildness. So, When you grow up as a child of the dry, in Southern California, where water has always been as valuable as melted silver in the irrigation ditches, the river calls you. The Santa Ana River calls me in the late afternoon, every day, just when the light changes to slant across the sidewalks. It is after work, and I'm in the yard weeding or watering, talking to neighbors or collecting tomatoes. My dog, Fantasia, stretched out on the sidewalk. Inside my fence are six live chickens, the bones of maybe 40 deceased animals, rabbits and chickens and sparrows and morning doves, and whoever else came to live here or was dropped off over my three decades at this house, and then ceased breathing two days or 10 years later. Along the driveway, which used to be gravel, is a strip of land where my roses and apple tree grow. Underneath is an ancient zanya, the Spanish word for irrigation ditch. The deed to my house built in 1910 says I have the rights to run my pigs all the way to the river, which is less than a mile away. But at night, when the light can't lower from hot silver to a defined bra bronze, during what I know now as the vespertine hour, the river calls to my dog and to me. 
It is so close. My girls used to come with us, but now they are gone. They are not vespertine animals anymore, and somehow I still am. It's the smell that we, we smell, the willows, cottonwoods, rabbits, squirrels, and coyotes. The Santa Ana River is not valuable in any of the way humans have imagined waterways or engineered them. Nothing is transported down this course of water. Not a single cafe or shop sits beside the banks of the Santa Ana. No kayaks carrying adventures or canoes bearing lovers. No fishermen making camp. People swim here under a railroad bridge during 100 degree summer days, but they are warned not to because of possible water contamination and flash floods. Vietnamese born neighbors harvest watercress and bamboo shoots, and Central American men sometimes wash clothes in secluded places and hang them to dry on cottonwood branches. Our Santa Ana River is the largest river in Southern California. It is 96 miles long, draining 2,650 square miles of watershed. Did you know that? It passes through four counties and winds near the homes of more than five million people. It begins in the San Bernardino Mountains, in wild canyons where massive boulders crash during flash floods, and then their smaller round offspring wash up in drifts of white rocks, which have been made into fireplaces and porches and houses for generations. In fact, there are walls here on campus made of river rock from the Santa Ana. After historic floods in 1862 and 1938 killed hundreds of people and washed away houses and ranches and citrus groves, two dams were built. Water was diverted for irrigation and water treatment plants, and most of the river below the Orange County line was channelized in concrete and riprap, like the Los Angeles River and so many others. But now it ends in a lagoon and whispers itself into the Pacific Ocean between Costa Mesa and Huntington Beach. But here, for 40 miles or so in parts of San Bernardino and Riverside, Norco and Corona, the Santa Ana remains relatively wild. I walk down the arroyo with my dog and then along a concrete flood control channel that lets out into the riverbed. We turn onto the Santa Ana River Trail, which, which runs beside the river from the mountains to the ocean, and my dog and I enter the singular time of early evening. Not gloaming or dusk or twilight, not yet. The vespertine hour. This is not the time of fierce Santa Ana winds, and this is not a landscape of wilderness and solitude, but this is the savanna to which all of us, even you, though you don't know it, humans and animals alike, have always been attracted. Dennis Dutton, in a 2010 TED Talk, calls this the ideal savanna, the landscape most universally regarded by humans as beautiful. There are biological and genetic components to our attraction. Open spaces is what we want as humans. Low grasses interspersed with, interspersed with copses of trees, the presence of water, of bird and animal life, diverse greenery, and a riverbank or shoreline, as well as what we make a path. According to Dutton, even when people do not have this landscape in their native countries, they view it as beautiful when viewed in art. One hour for my dog and me, alive with anticipation because animals are quick before true, true twilight. One teal hour, we saw a snake. I had not seen one in 20 years at the river, and Fantasia, who was nine, had never seen one. We saw black meander like flowing oil with yellow stripes. My dog froze, the young snake froze. She tested her scent, and my dog stared for a long minute or two. And then, comically, they both backed away slowly. <laughs> because that is also genetic. The Santa Ana River is part of my genetic heritage. It was such a large part of my childhood that when I traveled as a grown-up, as a writer, I sought out the great rivers of the world, landing in any city and making straight for the water that defined the place. I've walked for hours beside the Thames in London, the Seine in Paris, the Tiber in Rome, the Limat in Zurich, the Aare in Thun, Switzerland, where my mother was born. 
The Our River runs as blue as Windex, swift and cold through ancient villages. But our river, the Santa Ana, gives us this. My middle daughter Delphine said to me once, you took us to the river and up in those hills, the Box Springs Mountains, when we were little. And you said you wanted us to know how insignificant we were. I, I can't say I was the best, Mom. <laughs> you are nothing, is what I told them. <laughs> we thought you were crazy. But now, it's the only way I can figure things out, is being next to water. My eldest daughter is in Texas. Delphine, the middle child, is in Oakland. My youngest child is in Los Angeles. They all three seek out rivers wherever they live. Rome, London, Texas, even in Oakland. But the Santa Ana is their home. Wild opposite to celebrated waterways, the Santa Ana, in its wildness, so close to us, in the interstice between civilization and non-civilization, between us and nature, reminds us with coyotes, like the one who almost attacked me on Sunday, with the bobcat I saw a year ago, reminds us that there is power beside moving water and that we are little more than upright mammals moving across the land, seeking food and work and love like the coyote and the bobcat and the snake, every other creature in the fading light. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. With that, we'd like to open our um, forum for this afternoon, our symposium. Um, we titled this Renewable Nature back when we first started, um, d deciding what were the priorities. And this was an area that UCR has, uh, a, has been a leading institution for many, many, many years, even before we were a university. And as a way to start this, um, we started with the idea of the Gaia hypothesis. And for those of you from the 60s and the early 70s, as at about the same time that Earth Day was uh, beginning, which will come on Saturday, uh, we, James Lovelock proposed what he called the Gaia hypothesis, which is that the Earth is a self-sustaining system and it's self-adjusting. So it regulates different processes to keep um, the globe flowing. The real question is now, do we really live in a self-correcting world uh, as James Lovelock proposed? Or are we crossing a tipping point? And one thing that I keep reminding my students is when I was born, the globe was about 320 parts per million of carbon dioxide. Today we hit 300 or 408, and so that's the change. The last time the globe was three, uh, 450 parts per million of CO2, uh, which we were expected to reach in 2037, there was no ice in Antarctica. So what do we do? Well, I like to, uh, this quote from the New Yorker, I would modify it somewhat and say, guys and gals who think big thoughts, talking to guys and gals who make cool machines. That's where the leap happens uh, in a recent New Yorker. And so with that, I would like to introduce my friends, colleagues, and fellow panelists. First of all, Julianne Allison, uh, who helped organize this symposium and is a co-director, an associate professor of gender and sexuality studies and public policy. Emma Aronson, uh, associate professor of plant pathology and microbiology. Marilyn Fogel, the Wilbur Mayhew Endowed Chair of Geo ecology and the director of the EDGE Institute. Lou Santiago, professor of botany and plant sciences. And of course, Susan Strait, distinguished professor of creative writing. And with that, I would like to introduce 
the poor person who's stuck trying to chase us and herd us in the somewhat similar directions, our Dean Catherine Urich. Well, as uh, those of you who've worked with faculty before, yeah, <laughs> this is a tough job. But it's, it's uh, really a pleasure. So just to recap again, the Gaia hypothesis is really the question is if Earth is a self-correcting living system. Um, again, as a reminder, the last time uh, the Earth hit 450 ppm carbon dioxide, there were no ice fields. It's quite a significant change. So I'm going to start with Emma. Do you believe that Gaia hypothesis is correct? Is the Earth a self-correcting system or are we approaching a tipping point? So uh, I'll give the simplest and also the most confusing answer. Um, yes, the Earth is a self-correcting system. Uh, however, there are certainly tipping points, and I think uh, it is anyone's guess whether or not we are about to hit one, or if it's many, many years, or even hundreds of years, millennia down the road. I think it's, it's difficult at this moment to make that determination. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think that acting now before um, we hit a tipping point is, is of the utmost importance. And so I think uh, a lot of the research that we're doing is a, a helping us to approach these things. I'll give one example um, from my own work. Uh, in, I, so I study microorganisms that live in soils, um, and they produce and consume gases. Among those gases uh, are greenhouse gases, and one of them is methane. So it's not quite as famous, and it doesn't quite have the, uh, the cachet of CO2, of carbon dioxide, but methane, um, each molecule of methane is actually uh, 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 200 times more potent in the atmosphere at holding heat than each molecule of CO2. I bring that up because methane has been rising in our atmosphere just like CO2 has, but there was a decade from 1995 to 2005 when it stopped going up in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, since then it's been rising again, a bit slower than it was before, and certainly uh, it is not rising as fast as CO2, which is encouraging. Um, but in trying to analyze what was going on, why it slowed down, um, it does appear that to a certain extent there was lower emissions from various sources. Partially uh, the, the tropical um, uh, rainforest wasn't emitting as much, we believe. That's one of the possibilities. Um, but as that was happening, microorganisms in the soil were able to uh, compensate slightly for the slow increase in methane in the atmosphere, eating more methane directly out of the atmosphere, um, and then uh, preventing it from increasing. Now that trend didn't continue, there's more sources. So it, it gives you a sense that um, there is this self-correction that's possible that does happen all the time in this system, but um, it definitely, at this point, can't be assumed to last. We, we do know that we're pushing things uh, pretty far and, and we're not necessarily um, gonna be able to be protected by the Earth. Thank you. So Lou, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Are we approaching a tipping point? And uh, maybe you can add upon that. How do we tell if we're approaching a tipping point? Well, I think in, in terms of tipping points, you know, we're monitoring so much of, of the natural processes of the Earth now. And so what we're really looking at are rates of different processes. For example, the rate of CO2 increase in the atmosphere, we're measuring that very carefully and, and we can see it go up. And so I think evidence of a tipping point would actually be if we saw a dramatic change in that rate. Um, for example, um, as, as the Earth warms, if um, substantial areas of perma permafrost um, in the Arctic regions were to begin thawing out, and that carbon was able to be metabolized by those microorganisms and sent into the atmosphere, increasing the rates um, of, of CO2 um, sequestering in the atmosphere, a change in those rates might be a way that, that we could really tell. And, and so I think, um, you know, we're monitoring like crazy. Um, if something happens, we'll know about it. Will we, will we be able to stop it is, is the question. So actually, the th listening to both of you guys talk about this change is actually a little horrifying. And well, I know on one hand, you should do something. Um, but I'd like to address the next question to Julianne. So there's a tremendous change. Perhaps we're, we are losing the Earth as we, as we know it. So um, I guess a question for you. How are, people going to, how are people responding to this loss? Or how should we be responding to this loss? So uh, is this on? Yes. Yeah, OK. So um, it's funny that you would address me next because I was thinking, yeah, there is a tipping point in terms of how people are responding. Uh, in 2014, hundreds of thousands of people came out and marched 
in, in protest and recognition about climate change. And when I first started studying uh, the environment and studying the politics um, of, uh, of climate policy and uh, climate action, nobody even knew what it was, right? So that's just tremendous. But um, I'm literally saying what happens when we recognize some of the things that Susan was talking about, when we recognize that the things we love are disappearing. And so I knew that that motivated me in terms of my actions. Uh, I'm here because of the eucalyptus. When I got out of the car for my interview here, it smelled like home. And my first job had been in upstate New York. And right there, I hadn't even talked to anybody in the department yet. It said, if they offer me a job, I'm taking it. <laughs> because the world is supposed to smell like this after a rain. And so um, now that's what I'm studying. How do people respond when when the things that they love are gone. And uh, there are some philosophers and some psychologists who have uh, coined the term solastagia. And it's, the, it's a homesickness for the loss of, of the surroundings, um, the things that you know, the flowers that you knew, the animals that you knew, the places that you knew, because it is a part of us, just as Susan said. And I think what's happening in terms of this tipping point is people are realizing that. And so I'm looking at what people do in terms of mourning, the public piece of that. The first thing is they cry out. So, you know, Bill McKibben and um, even Cheryl Strait in, in Wild and Susan's piece. Um, and there's a young woman now who's writing about the uh, disappearance of the glaciers. So our, some of our writers are calling out, they're crying out, some of our scientists. And that's the first step towards people coming together and actually taking proactive measures um, as Emma suggested, in terms of trying to at least retard the change. So building upon the proactive measures, the next one is for Maryland. So we have these dramatic changes, this tipping point. What can we do to address these changes technologically? Well, um, as a, as a geoecologist, I think about what's happened over the whole Earth uh, span of Earth's history, going back not just hundreds and thousands of years, but millions and billions of years. The Earth has always been, I would never call it self-correcting, because whatever happens on the Earth is not incorrect. It is what it is. So what is the technology that can happen? I would like to um, comment about the rivers in California and uh, also a nearby lake, which is called the Salton Sea, and how uh, the way in which uh, people have handled these bodies of water uh, in, the, in the near past. And what they've done is to channelize them, build levees on here, uh, dams. And I think that that was the technological um, answer in the past. But uh, as we go forward on here and realize that dams fill up with sediment, uh, levees uh, go away, uh, water is diverted from a place like the Salton Sea for uh, growth in San Diego. I think that technologically people have to take science and scientific efforts and match that with engineering and come up with completely different ways in which we're going to handle our waterways, uh, water and how it's used. In, uh, certainly in California and, and greater than the world. So just to comment on your looking at rivers, it was in London and Paris. Uh, my rivers are Arctic rivers where there's not a soul around. And, and when I came to California, which was not that long ago, it was like, oh my goodness, are these the rivers? So uh, that's, I think that um, we've got to evolve as humans uh, to come up with new solutions of how to make our ecosystem fit with not only the reality of the day, but also the fact that humans live here. Thank you. I'd like to address a similar question to Mike. So how do you, how do you recognize that changes are occurring and how can we address the changes technologically? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, how do we recognize? One, thing is change is always occurring and one of the things that I work on is fluctuations and trying to tease a signal of change out of a signal of change 
And so what we're really looking for are long-term changes that completely shift the composition dynamics and fluctuations as opposed to those that just simply tolerate the, the, the fluctuations that we see every day, every year, um, or on different sorts of time scales. And that's probably a big, a big challenge. And it leads to some very different approaches. One of the things we've done is to uh, involve new technologies for measuring our, our ecosystems. And it's a big change because when I started out as a soil microbiologist, I would go out twice a year, take a core in the soil, bring back to the laboratory, spend six months analyzing it and have a data point. And then I would do a few of those and detect a trend. Now, what I do is I measure multiple places every five minutes or every day and try to analyze all the images. We have about 55 million images now that we're trying to figure out what they mean. So technologically, what we need are pretty much people from every field of science getting involved in the environment. And that is computer scientists, we need engineers, we need physicists, we need chemists, because the cycles and the processes we measure are very, very complicated. And trying to tease patterns out of patterns is our biggest challenge. Thank you. So you had a call for the scientists, but we equally need a call for the arts and humanities and everybody on this globe. So actually, I'm going to direct the next question to Susan. So how do we address this change ethically? Am I good? Can you hear me? Yep. Since it's my job to tell you stories, I'm going to tell you two little stories. Who, who in this room grew up in Southern California back when Kaiser Steel was going and back when LA, like you couldn't even see the Box Springs Mountains? Who in this, right? We would wake up and we knew it was a bad day when we lived two blocks from Big Sugar Loaf and we couldn't see it. And my mom was like, you're going outside anyway. And she would lock the door. <laughs> At 10 years old, they tested some of our lungs and found that we might as well have been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So like a lot of my friends just started smoking, because why not? <laughs> why not? Like, I know. <laughs> but here's the deal. A group of mothers in Los Angeles, if you want to look this up, it's a great story. In the 70s, a group of mothers in Los Angeles were so appalled by the air in Southern California for their children, and they were in LA, so people paid attention to them. They changed everything, and they were the beginning of the Clean Air Act. Those mothers were the beginning. So it's my job to tell you that story so that you could say, especially those of you who are younger, who are like, what can I do? You have to. You have to do it. We can see the mountains because of those moms. Like, really, we can. And I'm not saying that things are better or worse, but I'm saying that particular ozone and particulate matter that I inhaled for all those years is gone now. There are different challenges, though. And here's the next story. I just spent, I've spent my whole life going to Coachella Valley. Is anybody here from Coachella? Anybody? I've spent my whole life since I was six going to the Coachella Valley. And I just spent the last month doing a huge, long reported piece in Coachella. The Coachella Valley, I was in a date garden and you could see the Salton Sea at the end of the row of palm trees. But here's what else. Fish traps, archeologic site, where there were 300 fish traps built in the ancient lake basin of the Kawea Valley, which is now the Coachella Valley, not the festival. I'm talking about the valley. The fish traps are nine miles from the newest project in the Coachella Valley, which is called the Thermal Club. How did I found out? Because I went and spoke to all the migrant workers working in the fields, and they were like, you should go check out the Thermal Club. It costs $1.2 million to get a spot in the Thermal Club, which is a high-powered racetrack. People who buy these houses are going to be racing cars in the desert. There's huge amounts of landscaping, of course. To get from the fish traps to the Thermal Club, to go that nine miles, is to think that we have to think about what we're doing to the landscape. And so all I'm saying is it's our job to tell the stories, right? 
There shouldn't be something like, I'm sorry if I'm offending people who like, I mean, I like to drive fast, but I'm just saying, I'm from Riverside, we drive fast. <laughs> the point is though, we can't afford to keep taking the water for golf courses and places like the Thermal Club right now. Maybe we could in the future, but we can't do that now. We shouldn't do that now. It's morally and ethically wrong to do that now. So I think as long as you are out there in the world looking at stuff, you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to say, wait a minute, I'm going to write to my congressperson. I'm going to raise my voice. Not for all, against all golf courses. That's not what I'm saying. But against something that in a place where there's no water shouldn't, probably shouldn't happen. So I guess we have to tell stories. Thank you. So I may, ch may change this a little bit. So we've been talking about the tipping point with changes. The balance of that is the growth of human population on this planet. What resources are we losing to climate change, to this tipping point? So from methane to carbon dioxide to lack of water to all perhaps loss of species. You know, I'm just thinking you all are coming from different perspectives. I'm going to start with Lou. So what resources are we using are, are we losing because of this change? This is a really great question, and I, I think it really goes in two directions. Um, resources that we're l actually losing and resources that we're degrading. And so I, I think of a lot of things like um, maybe soil as a resource, water, really you know, fundamental life support um, features of our planet, um, we're, we're degrading in many ways. And often we take technological approaches to, to try to improve those. Um, artificial fertilizers, um, you know, channeling water and bringing it in from far away to very dry, large cities like Los Angeles. Um, but, but there are also resources that we're losing. And for me, as a field biologist that likes to go to the field, I get inspired by wild places. And I have to say, wild places are, are becoming a lot more rare. Um, even in the tropics where I work, in tropical forests, you think you're so far away from anything in some of these places. Um, but the, pre the prevalence of low-level societal activities, like a, just a road is how it starts, maybe a dirt road, maybe even a trail, um, a footpath. Um, eventually, you know, the roads get bigger, bigger things are moved along the roads, eventually they're paved, people start going off the road here and there. Um, and so these wildlands are really being degraded. And I think one of the best examples of it is um, a lot of the work I do in, in tropical forests are done in these large permanent plots that are spread out throughout the tropics. There's about 60 prominent ones. These are considered to be the crown jewels of tropical forest of the planet. And um, a study showed recently that the biological resources in these preserves are actually being degraded by activities right around them, um, by, by roads, by um, some hunters crossing into preserves and these kind of things. And so, um, again, I, I think really wild lands are, are one of the resources that we're, we're most losing, even in some of the best preserved places. Thank you. I'm going to ask the same question to Emma. What resources are we losing because we're reaching this tipping point? Well, you know, I think Lou hit on, on most of uh, the resources I would think of first, you know, water and soil. Um, but overall, I, I don't know that we yet, as, as scientists, as a body of people, completely know what resources we're losing and, and what level of degradation exists. And so um, one of the things that we're doing is, is actively studying very different ecosystems within our own country and around the world to try to understand what is what exists now? What are the resources we have? Um, and more recently, to really try to understand what are we losing? Um, I've been doing uh, research as part of a, a network across the United States called the Critical Zone Observatory Network, where the critical zone is, uh, it's a, a term that was coined only about 20 or 30 years ago, but it's intended to mean the active skin, the biologically, geologically, hydrologically active skin of the earth. It's, it's where everything happens. It's from the lowest groundwater up to the tallest tree in each ecosystem. Um, and so the first iteration about a decade ago of the critical zone observatory system had five, um, five different critical zone observatories and they were all in these pristine, beautiful places around the country. Uh, and uh, the Sierras included, that's the, the, the location where I'm doing my research is in the Sierras. Um, and then more recently, five years ago, not that recently, uh, in, the, in the second round, they realized that they were completely missing landscapes that are being 
actively interacted with uh, by humans. And so they, they introduced one uh, critical zone observatory that actually has multiple locations across the Midwest called the um, Intensively Managed Landscapes. And the reason for that is to really try to answer the question that you're asking. Um, and I think uh, there's some really exciting research coming out of that uh, that location about the changes in ecosystems and the changes in soils in particular and groundwater systems that happen uh, over um, uh, over time, but but because of human uses, um, and uh, the the other side of it is that uh, they realized this this program realized in the last couple of years that they had kind of missed the interaction with life. They were very focused most, mostly on the geology, the geomorphology, the hydrology. And what I think is really exciting is that more recently we're starting to integrate microbiology and plant life and starting to understand both the natural demands that plants and microbes have on ecosystems and how that impacts them, but also the, uh, the human, not unnatural, but anthropogenic, we call it, impacts uh, that we have um, demands on the plants, demands on the soils, and, and start thinking about ways to make sure that those resources last. Thank you. So similarly, Julianne, uh, so I was asking the, those, the scientists about losing resources, but it's not just about tangibles. It's about losing faith, culture, social connections, emotions, there's a lot of things that we have that I won't identify necessarily as a resource, but are really valuable to, human, to humans. Right. Can you address this? Well, I was just gonna say, as you hear about the different um, biological systems that we're losing, as both Susan and I have pointed out, we're connected to that, so we're losing ourselves. And one of the things I'm looking at, it's global mourning. So the process of mourning is that public part that starts when, when there's a wake or there's some outpouring. And when you move through that process of mourning, as anyone who has lost a person or a pet or a place, you find a way to internalize that, to make that, that person, that life, that place still live within you somehow, as it were. And so you change. And ultimately that, I think, is, is we are losing a version of ourselves, our cultures, our ways, the things that we eat, the places that we go, the ways that we spend our time. But in that, there's going to be, I think, a kind of a reorientation. They'll be taking advantage of all the opportunities that may be there for us to live differently, to not build racetracks in the desert. Um, you know, for instance, to live our lives differently and then to kind of go back to this notion of, of wildland, one of the projects that I'm working on is uh, in the Santa Ana Mountains, the Cleveland National Forest and the watersheds there. And um, it's really stunning that even though you have so much access in a sense, I, that's, this is like Susan has walked rivers, I've lived and hiked and walked and run in those areas. And in a way, yes, they're much more penetrated, but people still get lost. They get lost all the time there. They die there. I mean, this is my backyard. And for me, it's like, that's not wild, but it is. So we, we, are, we, we are gaining just as we're losing. It's going to be different. We're going to remake ourselves. And I don't think that I would be able to sort of go forward if I didn't think that that were true. Thank you. One last question uh, that I'm going to ask of Marilyn and, and, and Susan. Can nature continue to function? Nature uh, will continue to function. That would be my easy answer. Um, uh, and the question is, of course it will function, but exactly how it will function. So uh, with an audience like this, I should point out that the University of California has a uh, very visionary program that they started years ago. I'm the uh, Wilbur W. Mayhew uh, endowed professor, uh, Wilbur Mayhew, uh, spent a large part of his career uh, involved in conservation for California. And at the moment, there are uh, about 40 sites around California of wildlands that are preserved, uh, where uh, California students and professors are able to go and actually uh, study the functioning of these, uh, these ecosystems. So are we going to continue to function? Uh, it's a whole new world out there. And as Emma said, uh, UC has preserved these pristine sites, but it's as equally important to study the sites 
uh, that have been human impacted and figure out how they are functioning because I think that's what I, what's going to get us through this. Thank you. Susan, can nature continue to function? I, are we on? Is it, is it okay? Rockstar. All right, this, here's the deal. I need to ask you, do you sometimes feel despair? Like right now, do you feel like, wait, I would like to address all of these, but how many people in the room feel actual despair? Like right now, like what could I do by myself? Do, are, is anybody willing to admit it? Because I told you the story about the mothers because that's what I looked at when I was a child. I looked at people and I thought, my own mother who was an immigrant who only had a green card when I was born, which I was born in Glen Avon next to the Stringfellow acid pits, right? I don't know how I retained any. <laughs> not sure how I'm, why I'm even here. Um, it's because she moved to Riverside, wow. Look, the deal is I felt like my mother had power, even as an immigrant. I felt like she would talk to her, her city council person or her congressman. And I said to you, you know, you go out to Coachella and you see things that are wrong, but I don't know how I feel about it right now. I feel like I live in this, in this place that I've lived my entire life. I go to Coachella, I walk up Mount Rubidoux, and 99% of the people who are walking after dark with me are Latino. And everyone's walking up Mount Rubidoux, which is not wild at all. And yet there's grandmas, coming down the mountain in like Pentecostal skirts and like nylons, there's people with strollers. How could anyone want to deny someone the chance to go up even an asphalt trail up a mountain in order to have time with their family or to walk together? So I, I hate to not be able to answer that particular question, but it's all entwined with how you feel about each other as humans. Why denigrate someone who you feel is not worthy of being here in the same way that you denigrate the landscape. the landscape, And by the way, our orange groves are not native, right? Mm -hmm. And yet they're the reason that we're here as a university is because one woman planted an orange tree and I have oranges in my house from trees that are 80 years old. How do you manage the orange groves? How do you manage Mount Rubido? How, did you, how do you manage Coachella? I don't know. I feel a little bit of despair too, except for that at least it helps to talk, right? I don't know if you write to your congressperson and they even care anymore. I can't tell. I don't know. So maybe admitting a little bit of despair is the beginning, don't you think? And for those of you who are students, who are younger, I do worry about you. I have three kids in their 20s and I worry about them all the time. What will they have? I don't know what to say. Not quite sure. Thank you for your honesty. At this point in time, I'd like to open up questions to the rest of the audience. Don't you see a parallel in even the idea or the concept of tipping point, both in the planetary and human side of things? In, in other words, um, to me, tipping point uh, also suggests a lot of our human history that um, essentially is also vulnerable to the same ways we talk about uh, planetary um, tipping points. Wow, because I, I feel like I maybe just uh, said something that blew you away. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 again, I, 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 I know that we're talking about nature, but we are also talking about being in Coachella and for me hanging out with people who are living in a tiny little trailer and who are working all day in the fields and who are undocumented and what do pesticides mean to them, right? And as I'm talking to them, a plane comes over and gets ready to spray us all, and we all run. And there's little kids, like, right? It's because it's after school. So I don't, what does that mean when that's the lettuce that goes on your Del Taco? Because I'm going to eat my Del Taco, you're going to eat your Del Taco. If that's where the lettuce comes from, then everything that we just set up here is all contained in yes. It's knowing or caring. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, we're really hard on the earth, aren't we? We want our Del Taco, and we want it for cheap. And we want our Amazon stuff, and yet there's trucks thundering back and forth to bring somebody one pair of shoes. I know I already got in trouble with the thermal club. Now y'all are like, Amazon? You going after Amazon? I'm just saying. I try to live the smallest way possible. I really do. I think these shoes are 10 years old. I don't even, I found these pants. They belong to one of my children. I found them in the back room. I'm okay with that. I'm not saying we shouldn't buy anything, 
But we do need to think about all that, right? We need to think about how much carbon is used by the trucks delivering all the stuff we're ordering all the time. See, now you made me get in more trouble. That's how you are. Can I, can I add just a little bit? Um, can I add just a little bit to that? Uh, so I'm in uh, the sustainability studies program at UCR is in gender and sexuality studies department. And um, at the root of that is that a lot of the first, the first people, the first people in a society that recognize or have to deal with some of these losses are often uh, the most vulnerable, the women and children. And so that has always been true. Now we have more people, you know, looking at that and paying, and paying attention to that. So we all are in this, and to solve this, we really do, especially those of us who are the elites in this world, have to have a, you know, have to have some concern for the others that are out there. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I'm doing some, you know, this work on Ecological Morning, and when I looked back at some of the literature, um, some of you are familiar with Bill McKibben, who now has started the, three, you know, the uh, 350 organization and was in charge of the mar marches and all of that. One of his first, I mean, he wrote the first kind of uh, easily accessible, publicly accessible book on, uh, climate, ch on climate change, um, uh, way back in the 80s, and when I looked back at that now, I saw things I didn't recognize at the time. He calls out, he cries out in that, in that text, what am I going to do when all I've been taught is more, 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 and the only way to save the things I love is to have less? And you can't get to that point if you aren't able to recognize that the things that you are enjoying are taken away from others in some way. And so I think that that has to be a piece of that, that step. And it's hard. <laughs> it is really hard. Um, but I do see that it is beginning to happen. And so, you know, you have places in Africa and India um, and throughout the developing world where now they have access in some cases to cleaner stoves and to schools and some things because now more people are seeing that there has to be a different way forward for them to develop um, than we have. Thank you for the uplifting presentations, <laughs> which at the same time is hopelessly demoralizing. <laughs> um, it's up uplifting for me in the sense that you're bringing arts, social science, and science into a conversation on an important issue. But also, uh, raises an important question for me, which I hope you can help me. I'm thinking 100 years ago, okay, Western science and technology has given us so much. Uh, the oldest person alive today is 117 years old and doing very well. We have energy, we have automobile, I mean, I can go on and on. The um, penicillin, you name it. All these wonderful ideas in Western modernity is at the same time the basis on which we are now encountering the demoralizing aspect of your presentation. So my question to you is, if you were to go back on hindsight 100 years ago, would you insist on Western modernity, knowing what you know today, that each encounter with tradition will lead to decimation of tradition as we know it? Thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll start. And, um, you know, it's difficult to think about what you would do in the past, but I think that we would. I, I think that we would live with um, our, our modern technology, um, considering all the, the good and evil that it brings, um, because w without the problems, we, we wouldn't have the potential to solve them. And I, I, I know that sounds kind of like a paradox, um, but at this point, we actually have the capability um, to clean up some of the negative parts of our technology um, with the good parts. And so I, I think we've 
developed some tools, and I think it really comes down to how we use them. And I would add that um, uh, things that happened 100 years ago, I would agree with Lou, we would still um, continue on this road. I think what's surprising to me uh, at this point in time is I grew up thinking that science and engineering would always be respected by everybody in the government and that our word would, would carry weight and the fact that it may or may not today is, you know, it's troublesome and, and puzzling at the same time. Um, we are able to solve just about every problem that we have. We know what we need to do with CO2. I mean, this is known. We know what we need to do about the extinction of animals. We know how to save land. We have the money to do this, but we have made other choices. And so when you look at it, I think we went a, a, along a good road, and it's, again, turning around and saying we are going to do the right thing. I'm not demoralized. I'm optimistic. Um, my name is Sean, uh, third year. Um, my question, well, first of all, I don't think that the issues is um, not having enough technology or I don't think the issue is data. Uh, I think the issue is um, narrative. Um, the narrative of business, continuing business as usual, the narrative of sustaining the unsustainable. Um, and you talked about optimism. Um, I hope you can um, uh, expand on that. Um, what, what is uh, a narrative that we can adapt to really um, be driven by it and, and take us forward um, with the technology that we, you know, we have? Thank you. So I guess this is addressed to me, the optimist over here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I have to just say, since we're doing stories, I, I'm involved in the study of astrobiology where we ask the question of are we alone on the universe and is there life on Mars? I raise my hand. I think there's life on Mars. Okay, so you can tell where, where I'm coming from. Uh, back to the optimism. I think if you allow yourself to uh, go into where you feel despair and uh, defeat, uh, you, you're not going to get ahead. Um, and the optimism is there really are answers to all the, all the challenges that we have, but people need to choose them. And so I'm going to remain optimistic, and I think that when you uh, elect a, an official uh, of your government, you hope they will be as well, because um, that's their job. And as a, our role as educators is to train the next generation to uh, if you're not optimistic, which is a personality trait, is to train you for how you can uh, affect these changes. Can I add a little bit on to that in terms, I think you're hitting something really important. I think for a very long time, the narrative about what we had to do, is, as Susan and I have kept expressing, is really hard for people to take, right? Uh, but it's getting better. So when I was in college, I remember being, being told that in order for everybody that existed on the planet at that point to continue living and you know, distribution of resources, we'd all have to live like a Western European. Now, I was at USC, like right after you, I think, and um, that did not sound like a really good idea to most people. That did not sound like the American dream, right? Um, but now, that sounds really plausible. My students don't want cars, and they don't want to live in big places. And it sounds more, it sounds much more appealing. And so you, you are beginning to see that shift a little bit. Now, part of that is technological, so I'm, I'm, I applaud the optimism. We do have the ability to solve the problems, um, you know, technologically and in terms of what we know and et cetera. And um, as Mike has often said, if we don't, we will die, right? So... Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so, so we will make different choices and adapt that narrative or we won't be here, right? And I, and I think it's happening. Unfortunately, I think most recently it happened here because the economy crashed. And so people just didn't have the resources to live in the way that they may have liked to. But they've also adapted. And um, some people aren't changing back. They're continuing to conserve. They're continuing to take public transportation. Little bits, little bits. Emma? 
Um, well, I, I just wanted to mention it just really briefly. You were talking about the study of astrobiology earlier, and so it kind of brings us back full circle to where we started this discussion. Um, we were talking about the Gaia hypothesis. One of the ways that um, the Gaia hypothesis was developed, it was developed by Jim Lovelock and also Lynn Margulis, a pioneering woman in science. Um, and they were asked, they were tasked by NASA to try to figure out how um, to find life on other planets. Uh, and they began thinking about what could you see with the telescopes of the day on another planet that could be you know, millions of life years away? What could you see that would give you evidence that there's life that's there? Um, and uh, it, what they figured out is that it was com components of the atmosphere that shouldn't be there, that were out of balance. They were not in a chemical equilibrium. That would tell you that life is there. So maybe just to, to feed back to what you were just saying, um, I think, uh, we, if, as humans, if we don't figure this out, we won't be here. But the Earth, it's going to be fine. Um, it's a little depressing. It's a little hopeful. Uh, it depends on your perspective. Um, the Earth is going to be fine. There will, of course, be fewer species than there were when we arrived on this planet. Um, hopefully not a lot more fewer than there are now. That didn't come out correctly. Um, but uh, we were talking about this before we, we began this panel discussion, just that, you know, over the course of millennia, um, the Earth will absolutely rebound. It absolutely will renew. I just really personally, and hopefully many of you join me in this hope, uh, we want humans to be around to see it, to experience it, to get to enjoy the beauty that's all around us. I think that, that, but when he, when he brought up narrative, it was, it was great. Is it? It's on. When he brought up narrative, it, we're still telling stories, right? Everyone's telling a story. So, right, she's over there like, I'm the optimist, and how are you, the blonde chick from Riverside being? I'm not. I'm just scared. I mean, I, I think the first thing is being willing to say that you're scared, right? Because the thing you hold in your hands, the iPhone, also makes everyone feel all powerful, right? The iPhone is the thing that makes you scared, too, isn't it? Because you're looking at everything all the time. So maybe there's one last really cheesy story to tell you, and I know I'm talking to you too. So we were, we were Girl Scouts back in the day, here, you know, in Riverside that everybody made fun of us. But we went and picked up trash by the side of the road when we were Girl Scouts. Like, that's what we did. And when we went camping up in the mountains, our counselor killed like a 10-foot rattlesnake one day with a shovel. And of course, we all wanted to go home. And she's like, why would you go home? It's dead now. We were like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, that's just how it was. Like, we were up in the mountains. We were up in the wild. I had all this respect for my landscape. And no one else loved my landscape. No one else loved Riverside. People made fun of us. We were the land of methamphetamine. We were the land of arson. We were the land of enormous amounts of air pollution and smog. And look at you all now. This is a beautiful place. But people did fight for it. And I mean, that is the narrative, right? Again, I've got all... I've got. I've got 200 nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews all right around here. What do we tell them? I think we tell them consume a little bit less, go outside so you do respect the world and you don't want to hurt it. But I think the, the, the admitting we're scared part, I remember Mr. Gaynor growing up. This is a man that came and sat on my porch and he killed a pig when he was seven years old because he was an orphan. He killed it by himself with a hammer. He told me that story on the porch. He was, you know, the descendant of slaves in Florida. And he said the one thing that took him through the world, if you're scared, say you're scared. And I always thought, that's a really weird thing to say. <laughs> Plus, you killed something with a hammer. <laughs> and you're on the porch, and I'm supposed to bring you iced tea. He was right, though. If you're scared, say you're scared, right? And then go on and create your narrative about what you're going to do about it. So, sorry about the despair, man. I'm going to go back on the optimism side now. Well, at this point, I'm scared. <laughs> I'm so scared of Mr. Gaynor. But I mean, I'm ready. As he's telling you the story on the porch, I'd be a little nervous about that, too. But I know. I figured that one out. He was a roofer by then. He had a staple gun. So <laughs> we'd like to continue. There's more. Um, well, we're going to hear more. There's more than what you're seeing on stage already. So I'd like to thank you all for offering your individual perspective. It was a wide range. I was thinking Amazon. From the Amazon River to the Amazon delivery, we've covered it all today. So audience, please join me in thanking this crew for a wonderful presentation.
And at this point, I'll ask our esteemed provost back up to the podium. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank uh, Dean Ulrich and our panelists. I'd like to thank all of you for coming. If you look at your, uh, at your handout, and I hope you'll take it home, put it on your refrigerator, there's the date for the next Living the Promise session, May 8th. Really hope to see you all there. I just wanted to close by reflecting a little bit about the, what we've heard, right? So um, the Living the Promise, that idea gives us hope. And hope springs from the university. The university is knowledge, and it's people, right? It's, it's the chance to impact young lives, to, to uh, change the world one person at a time. And remember, as Susan told us in her story, uh, together we can accomplish much. So thank you. I uh, hope that you'll s come see the art and the science. Enjoy the reception. Thank you for coming. <laughs>